We are going to be once again in the Gospel of Luke this morning. Uh, our journey through Luke has been profitable for me, so I have decided to continue for a while uh, in this vein. And normally, in my introduction, I try to weave a story or a metaphor or some sort of analogy that blends to the text. But this quote popped in my head very early in studying this text, and I think it says everything that needs to be said in order to get our minds in the right direction. Philosopher Edmund Burke said, All that is needed for the triumph of evil is for a good man to do nothing. And you might be sitting back there thinking, Whoa, it's a little heavy for Sunday morning, isn't it? That's some thick stuff. But there's truth and wisdom in Evil does not need help to triumph. It simply needs a, us to do nothing. So as you consider that thought, let us look at the text this morning, beginning in Luke chapter 6, verse 6. The first half of verse 6. It says, On another Sabbath he went into the synagogue and was teaching. So Jesus is about his regular routine. This incident that is about to take place is not an attempt by Jesus to manufacture a test case in order to suit his own purposes. He is simply doing what he did every Sabbath, teaching God's people from the scriptures. This was normal for all traveling rabbis. Jesus was fulfilling this role. He was one among many. They went from town to town with their disciples in tow, and they taught the people in the synagogues on the Sabbath. After all, you can't travel on the Sabbath, so this is what you do. You stop and you teach the locals. It was a win-win situation for both groups, because it was a chance for small towns to hear the wisdom of additional teachers. And it was a chance for these rabbis to spread their particular message and perhaps recruit new disciples along the way. The second half of verse 6. It says that a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. And so here we see a clear case of need. We don't know what caused this deformity. Was it a birth defect? Was it an accident? Was it a disease? We don't know. But this is someone who needs help. There are very few jobs that someone with a handicap can do in the first century. They don't have the Americans with Disabilities Act. They don't have people who are trying to help those that are handicapped find work. Any sort of hardship like this is going to make it very difficult to earn enough to live on. Nobody is going to argue that this man doesn't, go, excuse me, that this man wouldn't benefit immensely from a miraculous healing by God. And if that is the case, then to heal him must be an act of grace, a righteous deed performed by the power of God. What else could such a merciful and loving act be than an act of God? Well, let's read the text and we shall see. Verse 7, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. So here we see a group of people who are looking for an excuse not to believe. Now doesn't that seem odd to you? Doesn't it seem odd that a self-interested people would use a miracle of healing as an excuse to denounce someone that they don't like? I asked you, how can a miracle discredit Jesus? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law have been listening to Jesus. They have been following his ministry closely. At some point, they went from being curious, which is what they were at the beginning. They wanted to know who he was. What was his point? What was his message? To being confused. He started saying things that they didn't understand, that they didn't agree with. And now, they are hostile. They have listened to Jesus' message, and they have rejected it. They saw the miracles that he has been performing with their own eyes, but have decided to ignore them. And now, instead of watching and listening to Jesus objectively to judge on the merits what he has to say, they are only observing him in the hope that he will do 
something that they can use against him. Well, they must have noticed this man. They were in the synagogue as well. They must have noticed his need. But they don't care at all about his suffering. To them, this man's troubles are only useful as a means of destroying Jesus. Here is a man that they have been so far unable to find any fault with. They cannot destroy him. How do you not recoil at such a thought? When that thought pops into your head, how does that not make you terrified and horrified of who you are? There is a handicapped person. Maybe I can use him against Jesus. Would not you be horrified to have such a thought floating around in your head? How low do you have to fall to use the suffering of others to your own selfish advantage? Consider also that these men are supposed to represent God. These are people who walk around saying they speak for God. To speak on God's behalf, to be models of God's behavior and God's character for the people. The corrupting influence of pride and greed and self-righteousness and power have destroyed them. Verse 8. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Jesus accepts the challenge. They say to him, Go ahead, heal this guy on the Sabbath. And he says, I will. He is going to help the man in the process of making his point. You see, in contrast to his opponents, Jesus actually cares about the man's physical need. Because of his status as God's son, because Jesus knew who he was, he is not afraid to help this man while he makes this point about the Sabbath. Notice also his behavior here. Jesus doesn't hide his good deed. He doesn't do it after the service, outside. He doesn't do it later on in that day. He does it right in front of everyone. He even draws their attention to him by asking this man to stand up in front of everyone else. Now you must be thinking, why such a display? That's not Jesus' M.O. in the Gospels all the time. He is usually being very reluctant to draw attention to himself through his miracles. He's telling people, now don't go tell anyone. Be quiet about it. Why is this different? Why a change of behavior? It's very simple. Because Jesus, as God, cannot stomach the lack of compassion being shown by the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He is seeing this and cannot take it. Such narrow-minded religion, if it even deserves that name, needs to be exposed for what it is. A sham of self-promotion disguised as piety. In other words, Jesus chose this moment to confront those who oppose him because he was angry. He was angry at their lack of even minimal human kindness. You see, in this moment, the spotlight is not shining on Jesus as he heals the man. It is shining on his opponents and how cold their hearts have grown. Verse 9, Jesus says to them, then Jesus said to them, I asked you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save a life or to destroy it? And now we see the story behind the story, that the system has become part of the problem. What was the Sabbath given for? Why did it exist? It was given by God to teach man to rest, to enjoy the fruits of our labors. It was meant to be a blessing to man, to say, take a day each week and rest. It was a designated day for the community to gather together and worship God. It was not a day for work. That was what it was supposed to be. Now, however, the traditions and the decisions of men have turned the Sabbath into something it was never meant to be. It has become a curse of a burden that made the lives of those who tried to honor it actually harder instead of easier. It had become a club with which people like the Pharisees would beat into submission 
those who would oppose them, those who would not normally accept their authority are afraid to do anything, lest they be called breakers of the Sabbath. And so it has been twisted into something that it was never meant to be. And as you listen to Jesus' question, you realize that it's supposed to be a rhetorical question. How far out of whack have the rules and regulations become regarding the Sabbath that you actually have to ask this question? By his question, Jesus illustrates the point. It should have been obvious. Of course you should do good and save lives on the Sabbath, just like any other, any other day. And yet, the people had been twisted around to the point where they are afraid to do anything at all on the Sabbath, lest their good deed violate the Sabbath somehow, and they themselves become doers of evil by mistake. Have you ever been in such a circumstance where the traditions and the culture that you find yourself in actually are keeping people from doing the right thing? Where people are afraid to work together with other churches so the needs of the lost go unmet. Where people are afraid of lawsuits and red tape and all of the things that get in our way, leaving those in need unhelped. How can we stand before Almighty God? How can we stand before the Maker of the heavens and the earth and plead failure because of such paltry excuses? The question asked by Jesus should have been rhetorical because it is always the right time to do a morally correct action. By definition, doing a moral good cannot be wrong. And those who try to narrow that window, those who try to place obstacles in the way of those who would do the right thing, who sow doubt and confusion, are destroying the work and they will one day answer for it. But I also wonder, why does Jesus ask the negative side of the question? Why didn't he simply say, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good and save life? He could have asked the question that way. Why does he bring in to do evil or destroy life? Two reasons. The first is this, to illustrate the absurdity of his need to ask the question in the first place. It should never have come to this. Those who were responsible for safeguarding the religious instruction of the people of God are to blame. If God's people can no longer tell right from wrong, then those who are responsible for teaching them have failed. Second reason is this, to show that inaction is not an option. If you simply ask the question, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath, that does not force people to make a choice. If we choose to do nothing, that is all that, that we are left with, and that is nothing. Those who squander their opportunities and their resources through inaction are the servant in Jesus' parable who takes his talent and buries it in the ground for fear that to use it and to invest it might mean to lose it. There was no sympathy for that man in the parable who didn't even try. You see, if we stand idly by with our hands in our pockets, as those in need confront us each day, we will be responsible for the triumph of evil. See, evil doesn't sit on the sidelines. There is far too much of it in our world today through the actions of mankind, the inhumanity of man to each other each and every day. Either we step up, get into the ring, and start to fight, or evil will triumph by default. So what does Jesus do? Verse 10. He looked around at them all and said to the men, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. Nobody has an answer for Jesus. He looks around. He gives them a chance. 
But fear paralyzes the average person in the crowd. They have no desire to jump in between. They know that this is an argument between Jesus and these religious leaders. And the last thing your average fisherman or mason wants to do is get in the middle of that fray. Who knows how long Jesus waited for an answer. I bet it was a little while. He stared at everyone in the crowd and said, which is it? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law know what the answer is, but they are not about to jump in. They are hoping that this will become a trap to destroy Jesus. It wouldn't have taken any particular skill to say the right thing here. You don't need religious training to know that it is proper to do good. The only thing you need is courage. This quote may be familiar to you. First they came for the socialists. Now, I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists. And I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews. Now, I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak for me. And those words were spoken by a pastor, by a man named Martin Niebuhr. He spent the last seven years of Nazi rule in Dachau, in the concentration camp, because nobody spoke up until it was too late. Jesus isn't going to let the silence go on forever, and he isn't going to wait for anybody's permission to do the right thing. With no answer forthcoming, Jesus answers his own question by the most profound way that he can. He heals the man of his affliction. Notice the way in which he did it. No prayer, no frivolities, no motions, no theatrics. Simply does the job. There can be no mistaking his point here. To do the right thing is more important than anything. It's more important than obeying societal conventions. It's more important than obeying cultural norms. Those are man-made rules. Righteousness comes from God. It's more important than considering the consequences. Good will always be opposed by evil, and we must not allow ourselves to be daunted into, into inaction by fear of the consequences. Let God, the judge of the living and the dead, be our arbiter. He will reward those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It is more important than keeping the peace. Most of us don't like to rock the boat. But what choice is there if the people of God are to be awakened from their slumber? Jesus declared that peacemakers, not pacifists, are blessed. There can be no peace in the midst of oppression, in the midst of hunger, in the midst of want. It is the job of the strong to protect the weak. Only when the righteous take action can peace be real. Only then are we making peace. Notice the reaction of his critics, verse 11. But they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. And now we see the beginning of the conspiracy against him. Not because they were right and Jesus was wrong, but because, but because Jesus presumed to challenge their authority with the truth. Now Jesus is indeed viewed as a threat to their power. In the eyes of the Pharisees and the other religious leaders, his association with the meek and the lowly cannot allow him to be to continue to grow unchecked, lest the masses rise up and reject the leadership which has failed them so miserably. For now, their conspiracy will be content to try to trip up Jesus in word or in deed, hoping to keep their hands relatively clean of his blood. But that won't last. When the truth is spoken with power, it always reaps an ever-increasing harvest. Eventually, when all else has failed, 
false witnesses will be called to lie about Jesus. The hated Roman overlords will be dragged into the process. And even that vile Herod will be called upon to help. <coughs> Talk about strange bedfellows indeed. This is the lengths that evil will go to in the effort to destroy those who champion the good. Is it any wonder that Jesus told his followers, take up your cross and follow me? So what do we take from this text this morning? Are there indeed limits to doing good, as the Pharisees would say? How do we live the teachings of Jesus each day? Let me tell you an awful truth. The limits that we self-impose on our efforts to love our neighbors as ourselves are already far more restrictive than any parameters that God would have us live by. Once we remove such barriers, we will find out that many things we once considered impossible are not only possible, but easily within our grasp. You might be saying to yourself, but we must be wise in our efforts. Indeed, we must. We must certainly be efficient with our resources. We must be good stewards of, stewards of God's gifts. And we must choose wisely between multiple opportunities. We must listen to the burden that God has placed collectively on our hearts. Yet in the end, such questions are small potatoes. Compared to the need to see compassion among the people of God. If our hearts are in the effort, the details will follow. If our souls burn for the lost, the direction we must take will come to us easily enough. We find ourselves at a crossroad, not only in the history of this church and this town, but of our nation. We see the door wide open. The door is wide open for us to work with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, whether they call themselves Methodists or Episcopalians or Presbyterians or Nazarenes or Lutherans or Catholics, any other group that claims the name of Jesus as their Savior and Lord. The door is wide open. Like any shepherd of God's people should, I will lead from the front and be the first to embrace each and every effort to show the world that the blood of Jesus Christ unites us more than any human choice could divide us. I will lead, but will you follow? The door is also wide open and stands before us to work with community and governmental agencies to help the neediest and the most vulnerable among us in cooperation with those other churches. To let our light shine before men as they recognize the love of Jesus in our concrete actions. Like any shepherd of God's people should, I will lead from the front and be the first to embrace this new challenge and this new opportunity to show the world that we are here to bear fruit as disciples of Jesus Christ, to reach out to the lost, to put away, excuse me, to put our money where our mouth is. I will lead, but will you follow? You see, Martin Neumann lived in a Christian nation. The nation of Germany was a Christian people, a land of impressive cathedrals and magnificent churches, a land with a storied history of faithful deeds, the land of Martin Luther, a land where glorious songs of worship had been written. But he also lived in a nation where Christian brotherhood had grown where groups of people were considered to be unworthy of God's love, where the cancer that was Nazism was allowed to grow unchecked until it was too late. You and I live in a Christian nation. We live in a land of impressive cathedrals and churches. We live in the land of the Great Awakening. We live in the land of the Billy Graham Crusade. A nation that took the torch of mission outreach to the world when it was handed to us from Europe and raised it up even higher. But we also live in a nation of declining church attendance. We live in a nation where there is a growing indifference.
to those in need. The time to turn the tide and re-energize America for the work of the Lord is now. The place is here. Will you answer the call? Will you take up your cross and follow Jesus?